Good morning, I'm Becca Hapner, and I'm going to read the scripture for you today. This is Romans 10, 1 through 13, New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal, for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth, and don't say who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart, and that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is by believing in your heart that you have made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that saved you. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord for who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Did anybody take me up on the challenge of reading the whole book in one setting or in one day? If you did, maybe you feel like I feel. I am not looking forward to Romans 9 through 11, which is right where we are today. And there, there's part of me that even in, in the preparation kind of went, we could create an outline that does not involve this, these chapters. Like, nobody would know. Because these are tough chapters. Way, way before I was speaking on these, just in reading these as a kid and as a teenager, and you always, you always get highlighting the good verses in Romans that you want to memorize, like Romans 6, or there's some great one-liners. Like, Man, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Romans 8, we know that God works together for the good of those who are called and who love him according to his purpose. And then you get to 9 through 11 and your highlighter just goes dry because you're thinking, I, what? <clears throat> the lack of head shaking makes me think that not many of you took up the challenge or you just skipped those chapters. So this may be retroactively applicable to you. Go home and read 9 through 11 and then listen to this message again. <laughs> Because the questions that it's going to kick up on you have been questions that have been brought up for centuries of trouble. Really, these chapters have been incredibly uh, divisive chapters within the history of Christianity. And as you read them, sometimes you're thinking, ah, I know these are inspired. Is that what really, really what he meant? Because it's, it's not uh, the flow and, and the ease with which we read the other chapters in Romans. We've talked so far about things like human depravity. We just don't measure up on our own. The sinfulness of our own condition never gets us to God. Which means that we need someone else from the outside to come and save us. We cannot attain our own salvation. Every single person is in that same point of depravity. And so God makes a way for us by sending his son Jesus to fulfill the covenant, to be a sin atoning offering for us, to cover our sin, to reconcile us with God. He does all of this incredible work that we can never do for ourselves as outlined in the Gospels, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And then we can only receive these things, not even by earning it, but just accepting it by faith, incredible grace that we don't deserve and we just accept it. It's really that good and it's almost too good to be true, but it is. And then we have this freedom from the law. While we're no longer trying to live up to the law, we can fulfill the law through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, who gives us an incredible amount of 
new way of being. Now, 9 through 11 takes up a turn on a side trail that is deep and heavy on Paul's heart. It's really about the question of Israel. And I'd encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, and I, sometimes we use the screen, so it's okay if you don't, but if you have a Bible with you, why don't you just open up to nine, chapter 9 of Romans, and we're going to look carefully at it. Paul is brokenhearted. And in fact, he says that right at the beginning of chapter 9. He's, he's brokenhearted about what he's about to discuss. And so as you, as you hear his, his words, I want you to think of a person who's, who's pacing back and forth in the room and somebody who's scribbling down his words that, that will become this letter to the Romans. And Paul, sometimes in tears, sometimes in sweating anguish and, and, and frustration, he's writing about the subject of his own nationality, his own people group, and he's really disturbed by their lack of response to Jesus. If you remember the stories of Jesus, his primary ministry efforts, were they to the Jews or were they to the Gentiles? They were to the Jews. His own people. Jesus, in fact, himself was born a Jew. It was the Jews, in essence, who gave him up, who turned him over to the Romans to be executed. It was the Jews who rejected Jesus even to his very death. Now Paul, if you, if you think about Paul's life, years later after Jesus had ascended, whose ministry was Paul primarily directing toward at first, Jew or Gentile? Absolutely Jews. Before he became a Christian, he was a devout Jew. He was a very, very intense Jew. And then when he became a Christian, his first efforts to, to speak about Christ were still to Jews. He would teach in synagogues. In fact, read through Acts, and you still find Paul doing the same things. He would go to Jewish congregations, and he would try to tell them, listen, Jesus is what it's really all about. All the law stuff, all the atonement, all the sacrifice, you've got to know. It's all brought together in Jesus. Jesus is the point. He was not well received. There wasn't a lot of traction. And God showed him that his ministry was meant to be much larger than just Jewish congregations, that he was in fact meant to reach the world. So Paul did a mission to the Gentiles, which is basically a, a word meaning everybody that's not a Jew. And he had much better reception with people who were pagans, who, who worshipped a, a multiplicity of other gods. And many of them believed in Jesus, and he got a lot farther. In fact, so he's writing to the Romans in Rome, whom he never met this church yet, and many of them are Gentile believers. Some are Jews. <clears throat> and, he's, and he's really wrestling with why there are so few Jews that have responded and believed in Jesus Christ, their own king. I want to read to you some of the verses in 9 through 11. And as I read them, these are just snippets that give a little bit of an outline in, in, in 9... Verse 2, he says, My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. And he makes this dramatic statement. I would be willing to be cursed forever, cut off from Christ myself, if it would save them. And then, if you acknowledge, like he just has, that most of the Jews, really the majority of the Jews, are not following Jesus, then the question comes to mind, well, didn't God call them as his special people? Aren't these the chosen ones? Did God pick wrong? Or did God's plan fall apart? So now he's got to answer that. In, in verse 9, 6, he says, Well, then, has God failed to fulfill his promise to Israel? No. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are truly members of Israel. N not all of Israel is really Israel. This is an important distinction that will show up in a little bit. So he goes into the rest of the chapter talking about how God has elected from within a group specific groups. Or he selected one and deselected another for a special purpose or a divine calling. <coughs> so he uses <coughs> the example of Jacob and Esau. Maybe you remember from the story of Genesis, Jacob and Esau were two brothers and 
Actually, the younger one God chose and the older one he did not choose. <clears throat> and he said, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Now you've got to read that in its original uh, expression. It did not mean God arbitrarily hated one baby boy twin and loved the other. It means Jacob I chose, Esau I did not choose. So within God's people, he's been selecting some for various purposes, just like the Levites. He selected them. He elected them to be priests out of all the other tribes. So Paul is using this concept of within a group, God still elects certain people for certain purposes. Verse 16, he says, So it is God who decides to show mercy. <clears throat> we can't choose it. We can't work for it. This is an important concept for Paul, too. He wants to make it clear that we know God does not show mercy or choose or elect people like the Levites because they earned it, or like Jacob because he was a better son. He, wa he wasn't even born yet. God chose. God chooses certain people for certain purposes because he chooses, not because of what we do or deserve. Verse 19, well then some of you might say, why does God blame us for not responding? <clears throat> See, Paul anticipates the arguments. He doesn't get to have a conversation with the Romans. He's not there. So he anticipates what they're going to say. Well, why does God blame us for not responding to him? Haven't people simply done what he makes them to do? This is the next logical question, isn't it? Well, if God chooses some for this and he chooses others not to do this, and these people do the wrong, are they really responsible for doing wrong if God made them do it? A great question, isn't it? He doesn't really answer it. He just warns us about our attitude. He says, no, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that, cr that was created say to the one who created it, why have you made me like this? Moving on to 10.4, here's a key verse. For Christ already accomplished the purpose of the law. As a result, all those who believe in him are made right with God. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then in chapter 11, he goes on to talk about this elaborate analogy of a vine with branches being cut off or grafted in, like some of the Gentiles being grafted in, brought into the family of God, and some of the Jews being cut off and disconnected from the family of God. And the key verse that we already heard Becca read was at the, toward the end of 10, 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are, some, there are some heavy concepts of paradox that are built into this passage. And I want to do as we've been doing throughout the time. I want to share some terms that will help us interpret this passage. And like I said, today is a difficult one. So I I'm, hope that you wrestle with it. I hope that you read through these chapters and other chapters like this in the Bible and, and can dig in and wrestle with some of the complexity and the paradox and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay out some terms that have been really important that have been argued heavily over, the, over this chapter. And some of these you'll be familiar with and you'll, you'll know why this is a, a tough passage. The first one is sovereignty. Sovereignty is God's supreme power or authority or it could really be anybody's supreme power or authority. I think we have slides for these. We'll bring them up. We don't have them? Okay, we lost them. We had them earlier, so something must have blown up. It's not their fault. They do a great job. But you'll, we'll just have to listen. So the first one is sovereignty. It's God's supreme power or authority. It's his rulership. So if we said sovereignty in a political sphere, we talk about whoever's in charge of that nation. But when we talk about God's sovereignty, we talk about where he's in charge of. The second term is this, predestination. Now, some of these words are actually translated and show up in the Bible, depending on which version you read, some of them aren't translated that way, but they're very important concepts, and how we interpret them says a lot about what we believe about God. Predestination is divine foreordaining of all that will happen, especially as it relates to salvation. In other words, God knew and caused and created things to happen before time, and it happens that way because he caused it to happen that way. 
there's a term in, in theology called double predestination, or really a better term is equal ultimacy. Here's what this means. Don't tune out just yet because you'll encounter a conversation at some point in life where people will believe different things about this. They won't maybe call it that. But it makes a tremendous difference how you go to sleep at night, what you believe. The view here is double predestination. God predetermines who will be saved. He not just knows, he decides ahead of time who will be saved and who will be condemned. He knew that before anybody was ever born and he made it happen according to what he, kno what he knew would happen. The next term is free will. Free will is, uh, there are a lot of Baptist churches called free will Baptist churches. You ever driven past those? Uh, sometimes the term has gotten really theologized. All it means is the ability to choose. This means you have freedom of choice. You can make a decision based on your own choice and volition and decision-making power. You're not forced. You're not coerced or limited. You actually have an option. The next word that is important for us to look at, and it actually shows up in multiple translations in chapters 8 and 9, it's the word election. Again, depending on how this is interpreted, it could go different ways. Election essentially means God's selection of a person for a purpose. He chooses some for a particular purpose or calling, which means ultimately, just like in a political election, if you have two candidates and you elect one of them, what happens to the other one? They go back to their day job. They're not elected. They don't get, you can't have two people fulfilling a one-person role. Here's another term that does not show up in chapters 9 through 11, John Calvin. <laughs> Although he shows up uh, strongly in church history, uh, he was an influential French theologian around the time of the Reformation. He was born in 1506. And he was also a pastor, and he was very involved in the dialogue of uh, salvation. His most famous work is the Institutes of the Christian Religion. It's sort of his systematic theology, and John Calvin you might have not heard a lot about him, but maybe you've heard of Calvinism. Essentially, what Calvinism usually means when people refer to it is this doctrine of election or doctrine of salvation. The simple version of strong Calvinistic perspective is found in the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. That's the next word, TULIP. Have you ever heard of this? Some of you, if you've gone to Grace or if you teach at Grace or if you're a student at Grace and you haven't heard of this, I'm going to tell your professor because they're not going to be real happy. TULIP is just an acronym. It stands for this. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So here's what those words mean. In, in this uh, theological strain of thought, it, it goes something like this. Human beings are totally depraved. We can do nothing to save ourselves. Unconditional election. When God elects a person to be saved... It's absolute and final. He chooses those who will be saved. There's nothing that we can do to get out of it. We're in it. Limited atonement, and the opposite could be said to be true as well. If God does not choose us to be saved, there's nothing we can do. We are condemned. Limited atonement means the atonement of Christ, the forgiving, sacrificial grace of Christ, does not apply to all people. It only applies to those God has elected to be saved. Irresistible grace means that when God's grace comes on you, if you're elected to be saved, you cannot resist it. It's irresistible grace. And the perseverance of the saints means that once you are elected and saved, you cannot fall out of that salvation. You are secured, and there's nothing that you could do ever that would remove you from God's hold of grace on your life and salvation. Now, to be fair, John Calvin's work was systematized and exaggerated and pulled in different directions by his students and those who followed him. So everything that you hear as Calvinism may not have been originally Calvin. One counter voice in Calvin's uh, discussion was Jacob Arminius. This is the next person. Jacob Arminius was a Dutch theologian a little bit later than Calvin. He was born in 1560, just four years before Calvin died. He also was a theological educator and a pastor. And he really began to teach some things that were not 
jiving with Calvin's theology. In fact, you may have heard of the, the word Arminianism in theology. Have anybody heard of Arminianism? We're going real deep for a minute, but we're going to come out for air in just a minute, so don't drown. <laughs> Jacob Arminius basically taught a, a variance on Calvin's thinking. He, he taught that atonement, uh, instead of limited atonement, he taught available atonement. The atonement of Christ was for all, but it was only available to everybody. It wasn't automatically applied to everybody. We had to receive it by faith. He taught the idea of preventing grace, which has been translated later to be called prevenient grace. In other words, God's grace does not just go to some and not others. It's actually at some level available to everybody, even in our depraved hearts, though we could never reach to God. His prevenient I'm starting to preach, and this is just the terminology. <laughs> but this is good news. That his grace is that his grace is goes before us that we all have the ability to, in some ways to be hit with the love of God enough to respond to it even our depraved states so that everybody can be saved who turns and it's still not based on their effort but it's God's grace which precedes them and then it's, it's sort of the initial warming grace and then it's the second grace which we receive through faith that saves us Conditional security, not perseverance of the saints, but conditional security that we can remain in Christ and we can be confident of his salvation, but we can also step out of that grace which we have received. Here's a name that might be a little more familiar to you. John Wesley, um, century after Arminius. John Wesley was an Anglican priest. Did you know that? He wasn't a Wesleyan pastor. He was an Anglican priest. But he founded the Methodist movement and subsequently the Wesleyan Church, and he was a strong proponent of Arminian theology. He really agreed. In fact, he became one of the strongest voices theologically of Jacob Arminius' perspective and prevenient grace and the fact that salvation is available for all and God's grace meets us first and we can turn so that there's no one who is ultimately condemned without opportunity to turn and respond to the grace of Christ. So you can see why this is important. You can feel the weight of this. If we looked at it in terms of the paradox, we have these things working in a paradox. We have almost a spectrum. If you can think about it like a spectrum, on the one end, there is this reality of God's sovereignty. God is in charge. He's in control. He's the highest superpower in the world. What he says happens. When he speaks, things are created out of nothing. Nothing can take away the, the power and the omnipotence and the knowledge of, of God. On the other hand, we have human choice or free will. The fact that we can make decisions. We can call some shots. We can make some mistakes. We can get some things right. And it's not all determined for us. Now, on the extreme side here, be something like total predeter predeterminism in philosophy or total predestiny in theology, but basically say this, everything that happens, everything that happens, down to what you ate for breakfast, what you're wearing right now, who you married, what kind of car you drove, every single thing that you think you decided was actually determined by God and he put everything in motion and while you have the illusion of choice, you really have no choice at all. You're only acting based on what you have been set out to play, the role that God already established. He determined, this is extreme one side. Every single aspect of some theologians believe is every, every particle of dust in the air, where it is, God had already written the script. He not just knew it, he caused it. Okay, that's the extreme on one side. The extreme on this side would be kind of like deism. God created the world, he set natural laws in motion, and then he just gave humanity free reign and said, have at it, and he stepped away, and he does not get involved in life anymore. After creation, God doesn't get involved. So we can run amok of the place or we can make it better ourselves. But whatever we do, it's up to us because God is not intervening at all. 
read closely in history, a number of our founding fathers were deists in, um, in our nation. And so you can see this tension of the spectrum. And you, you, you have the tendency to want to lop off one side or the other to make it fit. But the reality is Paul is talking about both. He's talking about a situation where people have made choices. Israel has rejected God. So many of his own chosen people have turned away from him, and yet God is still sovereign. His, his call and his plan is still secure, and he's not going to let him go. It's not going to foil the, the ultimate salvation of God, and we're not really to question his sovereignty. So I'm not going to reconcile for us the spectrum. I don't think Paul does. In fact, at the, at the culmination of his argument, Paul doesn't wrap it up neatly with a theological summary. He just ends in a doxology. He ends in a chorus of praise. Oh, how wonderful are your ways, O oh God, higher than ours. We can't see into the heavens to reconcile this paradox but we know you are good. There is some hope in this tension for us, and if we can hold on to them without being torn in half, either as an individual or as a church or as a Christian fellowship, we can see clearly that no matter what happens, no matter what bad choices or horrible things that people do to you, God has not lost his control. He's still in charge. You don't have to fear. He's still in charge of life. And you can have hope because his sovereignty is not assaulted. He didn't get dethroned by whatever happened to your life. We know and we believe that God works everything for our good, even the bad. He works it. He has control. He's sovereignty over it. He knows it's not a surprise to him. He can work it for our good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And... We have a real responsibility. We have accountability to God to do what is right, to respond to his grace, to make good choices, to run the world in the way that Jesus would be proud of. You can see the dangers of either extreme in, in your thinking, right? Those who set up the chair on sovereignty, it just, it just becomes a little too easy to, to sit back and say everything God determined anyway. Why would I need to evangelize? Well, out of obedience, I guess. Why would I need to worry? God has held me in his grace. There's nothing I can do to resist. You can see how that would tend to breed the easy chair getting clicked back a little too much. You can see how the Wesleyan perspective a little more on this side would tend to put it on a stationary bike instead of an easy chair and go, oh my goodness, I gotta, I gotta maintain my salvation. I gotta, I gotta constantly respond to this grace. I need to be sanctified and I need to be holy and I need to do a lot to do that. And we can forget the little aspect of God's incredible grace, which we never deserve and never live up to, and always receive by faith. And then we can spin our wheels on a spinner bike that's not going anywhere. So both of these are important. Both of this spectrum is, is important for us to hear. I wanna take a short turn at the end to a few small points that come out of these chapters that I think might be relevant for some of us. And I hope that you hear this in love because as Paul is talking, he's talking to people who are divided. He made a clear point, which I, I read earlier, not all of Israel is Israel. You remember that part? Not all who are in the nation are really the nation, that there's some other criteria that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, that those who believe in Jesus, that's the true Israel. So there's a sense of election within the group. In other words, it became really clear after Jesus that the kingdom of God was not the same thing as the kingdom of Israel. Jesus even said this really clearly in John 18. He said, before political leaders, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not this political kingdom. If it were, my followers would be fighting for me right now instead of letting me get killed. Paul is telling the Romans, your primary lines of identi 
identity are not whether or not you're a Roman citizen. It's not as important as you think it is. It's not whether or not you're a Jew and whether or not you follow the law. That's not the issue. What's primarily important is whether or not you are associated with Jesus Christ, whether or not you believe in him. That makes a Roman Christian and a Jewish Christian living in Rome more connected than it does a Jew and a Jew who doesn't believe over here. Now let's talk about the U.S. of A. for a moment. I am, I, I've traveled in, uh, to a number of different countries and I'm very thankful to be an American. In fact, I, I really, um, I, I would consider myself a patriot. I believe in the nation and what it stands for. And I would encourage anyone to love your country. It is such a divided place right now. And there are, there are so many lines and so many camps and so many issues that, that are so fracturing for us. And in attempts to reconcile, sometimes the divisions actually get further and further the more you fight about what's right. I would encourage you to find ways to work for the good of your country, to help it be a just and moral and good and right place to reflect the kingdom of God, to find ways to talk about political leaders that bring peace and a sense of commonality and submissive respect rather than further division. Does God have a specific calling on America? Don't answer it out loud. Probably. You could say that probably of every nation in its own right, just like you could perhaps say God has a calling or a purpose for every life. You have unique influence and unique resources and unique possibilities that he wants to use for the good of the kingdom. And you can say on a lot of the scales, America seems to be above the norm economically or military strength or size or things like that. And if that is true, then that's clear that the calling is something like this. To those much who have been given, much is Much is required. If the calling is anything, it's a call to serve. Jesus had more resource, knowledge, power, wisdom, capabilities, and influence than any other human being on earth, and he saw as clearly as day his calling was to serve. Let me also say, America is not the same thing as the kingdom of God. While Christians, and as Jesus would call us, salt and light, are always intended and commanded to go work for the good of the nation, to be a prosperous part of it, to pray for the peace of your city, to make it reflect in every office and capacity that we can the values of heaven, it's not the same thing. The nation of the U.S. is not the same thing as the kingdom of God. In other words... Our divine identity is not primarily in our passport. You have more essentially in common with a Christian Syrian, and there are, there are about a half a million of them still living in the country. Three-fourths of them have left the country because of violence. But you have more essentially united in common with a Christian Syrian man than you do your next-door neighbor who watches the same TV shows, eats at the same restaurants, drives the same streets, but doesn't believe in Jesus. See, Paul was talking to a group divided, and he knew it. So his tone, when he's talking about the Jews and their purpose in salvation, he makes these side comments in 11, where he particularly warns the, the people about their attitudes. Be really careful, Gentiles. I, I know you came in. Don't look down. See, the Gentile Christians were looking down on the Jewish non-Christians because, gee, you're the people of God, and we got it right. You got cut off. The Jewish Christians were looking down on the Gentile Christians because we're the people of God, and we have Christ, but we also have all this tradition, all this law, and you just come in at last minute, latecomers, what are you doing? Jewish non-Christians look down on Gentile non-Christians and Gentile non-Christians look down on the Jews as being some strange cult, minority. And Paul is saying, listen, what really matters is Christ. Christ. 
If you can find him as your unifying factor, then these other things really go subpar. Your primary citizenship is what matters. And be very cautious, Gentiles, about your attitude about those who have been cut off, not with a sense of arrogance, but with a sense of humility. So I want to ask, the little motivations of the heart, that's what I want to ask about. It's not something that may even come out in your words, or maybe nobody else would know, but I want to ask you to give God a chance to show you in your heart if there's anything there. When Peter realized this in Acts 10, he said, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. He was talking about national difference, racial difference. God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. The essential difference is who Jesus made us to be, not all these other dividing factors. Let me just ask you, in the recesses of your thought, if you ever feel more superior to a Mexican immigrant who may work down the road at a really lesser paying job than yours, documented or undocumented immigrants, not the question. The question is, if you ever feel better than them, more valuable and more important because you're an American, I'd like to put a descriptive on that attitude and call it sin. And the appropriate response would be repentance. If you ever feel pride well up or an attitude that other people might even call arrogance toward people who live in the Middle East, Christians or non-Christians, if you categorically look down on them because of where they're from. And you might not ever say it. See, the funny thing about this is sometimes we say words that people assume are racist, but they're really not. Our hearts are right. And sometimes we say all the right politically correct things, and we sound really good, but in our hearts there's a twinge of... The, the response for that attitude is Repentance. If you feel superior, if you think of yourself more highly than those Calvinists, like, oh man, if they would just read the Bible, then they'd get it. They're so dumb. There's no room for them. The appropriate response would be humility. If you think of yourself more highly than those Arminians, that are always trying to work themselves into salvation and messed up most of good Calvinist theology, the appropriate response would be humility. I'm not suggesting change your beliefs. I'm not suggesting adopt everything that everyone else says or reconcile and force conformity on all of your theological opinions. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about the superiority attitude of a heart that gets off track with the message of the gospel, with the message of Paul, who talks clearly to us to be very cautious about our own attitudes of superiority about ourselves. God doesn't show favoritism because you're white or black, because you're Middle Eastern or American. He sees the heart. And the quote from John, it is not his desire that any of us should perish but that all would find salvation. That's why he sent his son. I'm going to close this in prayer on that uplifting note. There have been a couple messages in this Roman series that have been hard, and they've been hard to leave, because that's where the chapters leave us. But again, next week is our final message. It talks a lot about optimistic sanctification, the fact that we can live a new life in the Holy Spirit and the, the sky is the limit on what God's power can do through us in making us holy. So that's a much more optimistic one. But as we close today, I just want to close in a word of prayer. And I'll just invite you to invite God to do a, a brief, short, heart examination. And if there's anything found wanting from him, give you a chance to let him deal with that. 
Nothing from me. Please, no guilt from me. Not a, not a shred of condemnation from me. Don't take any of that home. Just let God search your hearts, and if it's clean, then it's clean. Let's pray. God, I remember studying in China and learning the name for China in Chinese, Zhongguo, Center Kingdom. In other words, they named themselves the Center Kingdom in the universe. They thought they were the center of the world. Seems like most nations have that same perspective. Somehow we think we're better than everybody. It's almost like that comes naturally to us. You just think we've got it together and we're more important. Forgive us, Lord. Those are not the flags that we'll be waving in heaven. I invite you to search our hearts. Find if there's any unclean way. Maybe we didn't even realize it. Any residual or inherited disease of racism that may have found its way. Maybe we're carriers and we don't even express the symptoms, but we're still carriers. And you can point that out to us and relieve us of that. I want to thank you for your wonderful grace which we never deserve, but we always live into. We receive by faith. We walk in it. We run in it. We fly in it. And we want to share it as freely as it was given to us. Pray that you would help us live in the harmony of the paradox of your sovereign control and our important responsibility of choice. Help us to do that with love and compassion on others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd invite you before you leave to take just a moment and meet somebody around you, shake their hand, tell them you're glad to see them.